Good morning, everyone. I have the pleasure of introducing someone fabulous to you today. Dr. Mata Bagulizade is a second year child and adolescent psychiatry fellow at UCLA. She is currently serving as co-chief fellow while also completing a clinician educator area of distinction during her fellowship training. Prior to this, she completed adult psychiatry residency at UCLA and obtained her medical degree at UC Irvine. She is passionate about medical education to trainees of all levels, and this passion naturally led to involvement in quality improvement projects within the Child Fellowship Program to improve fellowship training. Clinically, she's interested in treating children and adolescents with severe mental illnesses in a multidisciplinary team setting. Following graduation, we are pleased to announce she will join the UC Irvine Psychiatry Department and serve as the medical director of the UCI Adolescent PHP program. Mata has been an absolute joy to work with this year and we are going to miss her. I also like to take an opportunity to introduce the discussant, Patrick Loney. Patrick Loney is a chief nursing officer for the Resnick Neuropsychiatric Hospital at UCLA. He is responsible for delivering and managing patient care and professional nursing practice, clinical education, professional development, research, and clinical services. Thank you for joining us today, Patrick. So please submit questions as they come up in the Q&A, and we will revisit them after Matt's presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Missy, for that. And thank you, Patrick, for serving as a discussant today. So let me go ahead and share my screen here. Give me one moment. And then, all right. So I think Misty, I think Patrick, but I want to thank you all for coming and joining my talk today. Uh, the title of my presentation is Improving Child Mental Health Systems Involving Trainees and Safety Event Reviews for Growth. And we'll get started. Oh, I do wanna actually say one thing before we get started. Um, I was preparing this talk last night and it was a little bit challenging because I was watching the Laker game last night, if any of you guys are Laker uh, fans. And so if, if there's anything that's off because this, uh, with this talk, it's because the Lakers went into overtime last night and um, made it very, uh, oops, sorry, uh, made it very hard to focus on uh, preparing this talk for you all. All right, so uh, to get started, I don't have any financial disclosures to reveal. I did want to disclose that I um, am not an expert in safety event reviews. And so uh, please take whatever I say with a grain of salt. But in uh, you know, doing and preparing this presentation, I found this topic very fascinating, very rewarding, very meaningful to talk about safety re event reviews and fellowship. And so I want to share with you all what I've learned. So I have a brief outline of what we're gonna talk about today, but before I do that, I just wanna share with you all a little bit of the impetus of why I'm doing this talk today. You may have heard, you may not know, but in our fellowship training program this year, we started uh, something called the, what I have here, the UCLA Child Mental Health Systems Improvement Series. And what that was is in essence, we came together as trainees, as uh, psychiatry interns, psychology, psychiatry fellow psychology interns, and we, reviewed uh, events of, you know, we did in essence a revamped morbidity and mortality conference where we reviewed adverse events. And so I wanted to talk about that series, but uh, I think it was important first for us to go through a little bit of history of what are adverse events in psychiatry, what are some systemic factors that might contribute to them, and then what is the role and the importance of morbidity and mortality conferences in psychiatry and assessing these adverse events. But then going from there, I'm going to talk about why, I mean, you, you might know this, you might not know this, but MM conferences aren't that common in psychiatry. You might know this now because you might think, oh, we haven't had MM conferences in our field. And so what are the reasons for that? And then going from there, I'm going to talk about from the literature review I've done, what are some um, discussions around ways to successfully implement MM conferences in psychiatry and what I've learned. And then lastly, I'll talk about what we started this year at UCLA in our child fellowship program of uh, the UCLA Child Mental Health Systems Improvement Series, how we set up our conference, 
and uh, the takeaways we got from those conference. We have some data that we collected. I'd like to present that to you guys today, today as well. Okay, so if there's three goals, I hope you walk away from this present presentation today with, it would be one, that you walk away with a sense of an ability to recognize systemic influences on adverse outcomes in psychiatry. Two, I hope you walk away understanding the role and the importance of morbidity and mortality conferences in our field. And then three, I hope you walk away with a sense of uh, understanding of how to implement an effective discussion around safety events with our trainees. Uh, in this last point, you know, I, if I have a, uh, you know, an overall goal for this talk, I'm hoping you all take this and then run with it after I graduate and uh, continue these conferences. Hopefully if you found them beneficial and you find this um, presentation to make a compelling argument for it. Okay, so uh, I want to start my presentation with this slide. I have uh, this picture here. It's the picture of a publication that was made in 2001 uh, by the Institute of Medicine, and it was titled To Air is Human, Building a Safer Health System. And so what it is, is there was a group of researchers, clinicians, policymakers, payers, uh, patient advocates who came together and reviewed patient adverse like safety event data, big data that had been collected prior to that, and look, to look and see how do we make, how do we reduce um, these adverse events that are happening in medicine. And it, it was this long volume that they compiled, but their main assertion in that volume was that the, the quote I have here, the problem is not bad people in healthcare, it's that good people are working in bad systems that need to be made safer. And so this, this publication was over 20 years ago, but they started this national agenda of how to really focus in the United States on systems improvement in order to improve patient safety here in our country. So then going from there, um, we know that unfortunately adverse events are common in all of medicine and psychiatry is no exclusion. Uh, there, there's all kinds of adverse events that can happen in all of our fields, medicine, pediatrics, surgery, psychiatry, but there are a few that are particularly more prevalent in psychiatry. And so I'd like to share them with you here. Um, looking at this chart, I adapted it from a couple of different articles that talk about this, but um, you know, really common ones, but the ones we think of more, most frequently is uh, suicide, unfortunately, self-harm, uh, overdose, uh, might be aggression, that, you know, that, that's like physical assault between patients, patients to staff, staff to patients. Uh, unfortunately, we see sexual assault uh, with our patients, whether it's between patients or between patient staff. Uh, then, you know, other adverse events you can think about is, you know, the excessive restrictive, excessively restrictive care. And so that might be giving IMs too quickly or placing someone in seclusion or restraints when um, it might not have been necessary. And then we also have uh, medication, prescription, dispensation, adverse events related to that, whether it's an adverse drug event from a medication that um, was planned to be given, or if there was some kind of error in the prescription of the medication or the dispens dispensation of the medication that led to the adverse event. And after that, there are other injuries. This is a big catch-all. There's only a couple examples in this um, category, but you know, patients fall in our units all the time. There might be injuries, secondary to treatment, for example, ECT. We can think of other injuries, patient punching a wall, um, other, you know, whatever comes to mind. This isn't an, an exhaustive uh, list, but miscellaneous other that would be there. And then lastly, think about adverse events related to appropriate disposition whether that's rapid readmission, representation, and I put in that category, the, um, the adverse event of elopement that we see in psychiatry as well. Okay, so when adverse events happen, how do we review them? Well, you know, there's a few, two, there's two strategies you can take to uh, approach this. You know, you could approach uh, reviewing an adverse event, event by performing a root cause analysis where you're assessing a C, what the initial significant error was, or you could approach it using a systems analysis. And we'll talk a little bit about that in a moment. I actually have another slide here where I tried um, doing a little bit of a 
oversimplification of the two. And so if you see something that feels um, not quite right here, I, I wanna make that disclaimer that uh, I, I just want to put this out here so we all have a little bit of language around uh, and framework around what a root cause analysis might be used for and what a systems analysis might be used for. But a root cause analysis, this is when oftentimes hospitals already have this process in place where if there's a serious adverse event, like if there's a suicide on a unit, there is a committee that will review that adverse event. Um, and the role of it might be to assess for a primary error or a factor, the primary factor that was contributing to the event using the root cause analysis. But those committees are typically carried out by non-involved individuals. They might interview the people who are involved, but the review is done by non-involved uh, members of either that specialty or outside specialties as well. And because of the seriousness of that adverse event, it might take a long time to make recommendations uh, using this model, and the recommendations might be delivered to a very limited audience. So there's some some pros to having a root cause analysis, but also some limitations to um, using that to review an adverse event. Whereas on the contrary, we have a systems analysis. So this is the format that is typically used in m and conferences following a range of adverse events. It doesn't necessarily have to be the most serious adverse event. It could be any, any of the ones we were talking about in the last slide uh, with that chart. So uh, a systems analysis can be involved, it can be carried out by involved or non-involved individuals. The uh, format can be much more open than the small committee who's reviewing it. This can be open to a whole department doing a systems analysis. Uh, you may assess for, in a systems analysis, you assess for various systemic factors that might have contributed to the event, as opposed to just trying to find what was the one or a couple of significant, most significant uh, core factors that contributed to it or starting factors. And then, you know, in comparison to root cause analysis and what I was describing here, the discussion in, for example, a mor morbidity and mortality conference would be very informative to the participants right there in real time. So I wanted to share this slide. Uh, it's a lot of text. I don't anticipate you reading it all, but I wanted to talk about, you know, what do I mean when I say systems analysis? Um, I, I mean, taking a look beyond, if there is an adverse event, taking a look beyond the specific individuals who might've been involved or team members who might've been involved or the patient and what can, factors they just had and taking pulling back the lens to look at additional factors and thinking what else is in um, this framework of the system. And so the table I'm sharing here, I actually pulled it from this article that was uh, published in the New England Journal of Medicine in 2003. It was titled Understanding and Responding to Adverse Events. And the author, um, uh, PhD researcher Charles Vincent, created this framework of looking at what are the factors that influence clinical practice and contribute to adverse events. And he created this framework for um, all of healthcare. This isn't psychiatry specific, but you see he uh, included you know, the patient at the first step, but also what's the task at hand that was being done for the individual staff members involved? What's the team structure like? What's the work environment like? What's the organization and management? contributing factors and the most institutional contributing factors. And all of these could come together to contribute to um, an adverse event. It doesn't necessarily mean that there's one thing that was wrong here, but they all can uh, intermingle in, uh, in, in contributing to an adverse event happening. And so because that uh, framework was developed for healthcare in general, I took the framework he had and I put it on this um, fishbone diagram that I think you all have seen before. So uh, we, when we wanna look at when there is an adverse event that's happened, it might be helpful having this kind of framework where you're looking to see uh, visually what factors might have contributed. And so the question I have here is what systemic factors may contribute more specifically um, to our field, to adverse events in our field. So I wanted to take a moment and pause and have you all just think in your mind more, you know, generally, we don't have a specific case in mind, but if there is an adverse event in psychiatry, are there um, 
unique characteristics that we have in our field that might contribute to them. So I'll sit quietly for a moment, let you guys think of it. Think of the patient factors, task or protocols that we might have, individual staff members, you know, what might that contribute, team factors, our work environment, organization and management. If I was tech savvy enough, I would have put one of those um, links where you guys can text in and uh, you know, we would have this whole model, uh, pop up of people's suggestions. Um, I'm not tech savvy enough, so I hope you have some ideas popping up in your own head. But then, so I spent some time trying to think about this of uh, what it taking, uh, what I've read in some of the literature and also what we see in the hospital. So I want to share with you just some of the ideas that came up. This is in no way uh, an exhaustive list, but um, for under patient. When we think about patients who uh, especially are hospitalized on an inpatient psychiatry unit, they're frequently acutely mentally ill and uh, emotionally unstable, which does contribute to adverse events in our field. Um, I think something that contrasts from medical or surgical units is the patients are away from their friends and family and support. They don't, they don't have the ability to keep their, especially in our unit, but keep their support systems with them during the duration of their hospitalization, which can lead to some adverse events. And then lastly, I think it's important to remember, uh, in contrast to patients who are hospitalized in a medical or surgical unit, a patient who's hospitalized in our inpatient psychiatry unit is often very physically healthy, strong, and mobile. Um, and that's not necessarily the case oftentimes if someone's um, quite ill enough to be hospitalized in another unit. For task and protocol, some of the protocols I was thinking about of what might contribute to adverse events in psychiatry you know, our protocols around placing restraints, what are our protocols around ordering IMs? Do we order them right off the bat when a patient's hospitalized or do we order them on a, on a stat basis? Um, how do we get security involved? We have uh, a frequent security involvement in our patient population. And so what's the protocols around that? And there's so much more. These were just a few that came to my mind. Uh, around individual or staff member, we can think about this is more general to all of medicine. This isn't necessarily psychiatry specific, but individual staff members, we all vary in what our knowledge and our training is, how much therapy do we know or, not, or what have we been trained in? Uh, what de-escalation tactics do we have and more? Um, but th there's even more factors beyond this you know, uh, that aren't necessarily psychiatry specific, but we know that um, for individual staff members, you know, being on call, the burden, the, um, time, the energy that takes to you know, be present all the time uh, takes an effect as well. Team factors, these are more general. There's not necessarily psychiatry specific, but what communication do we have in our teams? What's the team leadership like? There's some things to keep in mind. Work environment, uh, something else that's unique in psychiatry is we have common patient areas. Our patients intermingle on our in inpatient units, on our PHPs, um, even in group therapies. It, so it does while that's such a benefit of our field, it can um, be a factor that could contribute to adverse events potentially. And then something I wanted to bring up here is, I wrote uh, ECT available. I wanted to bring up that the availability or unavailability of certain procedures we can think of as potentially contributing to adverse events. If there's a, a severely depressed patient who would warrant treatment with ECT, and a facility does not have that available, does the lack thereof of ECT lead to, uh, potentially to an adverse event? That's something to think about. And then lastly, the, the point I wanted to bring up is, what we know is very unique in our field is our uh, ability to place patients on legal holds. Frequently, we have patients who are hospitalized against their will, um, whether it's a kid who's been signed in by their parents that they don't wanna be there, or a kid or adult who's um, placed on a hold and uh, that can lead to a lot of adverse events. But I think that highlights the second point I put there is in our field, there is a very significant power imbalance, even more than sometimes in the other fields of medicine between the mental health practitioners and the very vulnerable clientele uh, we serve. And I think that is kind of an overarching factor to be mindful of when we think about adverse events in psychiatry. So now I want to transition a little bit. So we've talked about 
you know, what are some of the adverse events in psychiatry? What are some of the systemic factors that may be contributing to them in health care as a whole or in psychiatry specifically? And we've talked about forms, the root cause analysis or uh, systems analysis to assess uh, adverse events. So now that we have that, I want to talk about why, um, what is the case for having morbidity and mortality conferences in psychiatry? Why are they important? And so these conferences, well, first off, just to give a little bit of a background of it, they're a forum, a morbidity and mortality conference would be a forum where you discuss patient cases or cases where there are adverse outcomes among a broader audience of attendees. So that might include um, people of that specialty or multidisciplinary attendees. And in mor morbidity and mortality conferences, the, um, the structure is that you use a systems analysis and you use to, to assess the adverse event and you try to shift the focus from just looking at one individual or one specific factor to more system level factors that led to errors. And so the goal of that conference would be first to create targets for systemic improvement in care. And then second, to create familiarity with how to utilize resources already available within the system, because it might not be that we need to create new resources, but just become um, more facile with the ones that we have. And lastly, the overall goal we always have for our patients is to reduce harm and really with these conferences to reduce the iatrogenic harm um, that is present in, in medicine. And so I wanted to add this quote at the end here that I read in one of the articles I was reviewing and it was talking about morbidity and mortality conferences in general. And it said, these conferences are an institutional expression of our responsibility to face and profit from our mistakes, both as individuals and as a profession. And I thought that was really um, important. Although I didn't like the word mistakes, but we'll take it. So now as, our, as my title suggested, uh, I think it was, I said something like involving trainees for growth and uh, adverse event reviews, safety event reviews. And so then it, that begs the question, why should trainees be involved in these morbidity and mortality conferences? Why shouldn't this be uh, just a hospital endeavor, leadership endeavor? Um, and and I wanna make a case that actually we should be involved in. And first off, trainees are in the front lines of patient care. And whether we like it or not, we're, we're usually the ones that are actually aware of the adverse events, see the adverse events, along with the systems level issues that may have contributed to them. And so I think we bring a very fresh and um, clear perspective to what might be going on, a lot of um, good ideas to what might be contributing to that adverse event. Second, uh, I think it's important to highlight that um, these, as, as the quotation before suggested, there's a lot of learning value, fortunately and unfortunately, when there are these uh, reviews of adverse events, um, there's there's this um, knowledge that comes that we all know uh, when when we see when something doesn't go quite right, how to actually apply it again and kind of try it again and do it better. And so I think that knowledge is invaluable that comes with M M conferences. And then lastly, and in some ways the most important factor of why we should include trainees in these conferences is that um, oftentimes trainees might actually be involved in the adverse event. And having a morbidity and mortality conference would allow a venue for uh, a group to actually openly discuss the systemic factors that, are, um, that contribute to the adverse event. So the trainee doesn't feel this sense of um, self-criticism, responsibility, um, and it may reduce their sense of blame, shame, or guilt when an adverse event does occur. We all know that we're all highly, um, uh, maybe uh, we're, we're all very high achieving in this field. And uh, the practice of medicine sometimes demands that mistakes never be made. And in and, and wanting to live up to that level, oftentimes um, there's not room to be uh, you know, open and, and we, we have this kind of inbred sense of, um, responsibility oftentimes that can lead into this uh, sense of shame and guilt when something goes wrong. But by not having this culture of silence and actually talking about adverse events and looking at um, these events in a systemic way, it can really reduce um, these negative impacts that can happen when an adverse event occurs. Okay, so now uh, 
why are M&M conferences uncommon in psychiatry? If you didn't know, um, they are uncommon in psychiatry. I think there was a study back in 2009 done by Goldman, and they were uh, reviewing M&M conferences, and they saw back in 2009, there were only nine published articles on psychiatric M&M any kind of endeavors in the prior four years before that. And this is in stark contrast to the many, many, many more in our uh, medical and surgical uh, fields um, where m M&M conferences are quite, quite common. So the question then becomes why? Why, why are m M&M conferences so much less common in psychiatry? Some questions that were raised in these articles, is it because there's a relative rarity of mortality as a result of psychiatric illness. You know, we don't see, fortunately, patients dying on our units very, very commonly. But that being said, um, we have a, a very strong, um, unfortunate, um, high rates of morbidity in psychiatry. So I think that's interesting to remember. And the other thing I, I want to bring up is maybe another cause why m M&M conferences are uncommon is that psychiatric patients have actually been uh, excluded from major studies of adverse events before. So if you remember that uh, first slide I started with the uh, Institute of Medicine report to Air is Human. That report was uh, actually didn't mention mental health care or psychiatry at all in the report. It had references to other fields, and that's because the data that they were reviewing uh, was this big da- these big data sets that came from studies where they specifically excluded patients who had a primary psychiatric diagnosis. And so when when there's not as much robust data about what are the adverse events and what are the safety outcomes in psychiatry, there's less impetus to um, really have that same kind of national agenda to uh, make a shift and uh, focus on systems improvements in our field. And then under that, you know, these might not be factors as to why m M&M conferences are uncommon in psychiatry, but maybe in, in healthcare as a whole. But you may know this, there, there can be a stigma of blaming culture sometimes associated with M&M conferences because you are looking at um, when bad things happen, when adverse events happen. And so sometimes there can be that stigma. Along with that, uh, there could be a tendency for conferences to degrade into lectures and that, that um, people might wanna avoid doing that and just have a specific lecture instead. And lastly, um, these conferences sometimes might have a perception that great ideas are dismissed at the door. What's the point of having this conference if nothing's going to be uh, done about these um, systemic factors? And so that might contribute to the lack of their um, presence. Okay. So then knowing all that, knowing that there is a benefit, but there are some limitations and um, that they're not very common in psychiatry, how would you successfully implement a morbidity and mortality conference in psychiatry? you know, first, I'll, I'll take the point I was making earlier, you would invite trainees. Um, you can invite faculty and department or hospital leadership to have a more robust conversation, uh, a more open conversation on adverse events. You would have routine sessions scheduled with sufficient time allocated to actually um, have these conversations and have structure to the sessions where there is a patient adverse event presented and then a group discussion on the systems analysis that's really important because if you don't have structure, it can devolve very quickly into um, a, an effective conversation around an adverse event. I think this point is really important. There needs to be action item takeaways after an M&M, during an M&M conference so that uh, there is a sense of what's going to actually be done now that we've identified systems factors. And then there needs to be follow-up at the following sessions with what um, came from those action items. So the attendees uh, have a sense that the discussion was actually fruitful and beneficial to the overall goal that we've had of reducing iatrogenic harm, creating systems improvement. Here's just a point of, uh, you know, avoid lecturing at participants uh, is important in uh, M&M conference. I wish this was a conference where I wasn't behind a screen and, and lecturing to you all faceless individuals here, but um, uh, you know, this is an M&M conference, so we'll take it. And lastly, but most importantly, um, there needs to be a focus and an emphasis on maintaining confidentiality and avoiding 
blame, bullying, and disrespect, and really setting the stage for the conference that 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 be that language and that behavior isn't isn't tolerated in these conferences. So then that leads me to talking about what we started here at UCLA this year. Um, the title of our, the, in essence, Morbidity and Mortality Conference we started is the Child Mental Health Systems Improvement Series. I want to give credit to where credit is due. We actually didn't originally come up with this idea. Uh, we borrowed it from the Yale Adult Psychiatry Residency Program, where a few years ago they started their mental health systems improvement series. And so we were very creative and added the word child in front of it um, in our child psychiatry department. And so, uh, but that decision was actually intentional because we could have called it Child Psychiatry Morbidity and Mortality Conference, uh, but that doesn't necessarily tell you what we're hoping to achieve in these, in these sessions. Our real goal is systems improvement. And by being intentional with the name of um, the Child Mental Health Systems Improvement Series. I hope that that conveyed to the participants as well that um, that's what we're uh, hoping to achieve here. So I wanna talk a little bit about uh, how we structured these series, what we did. And so how we went about this this year was we solicited cases of adverse events voluntarily from trainees and faculties prior to each session. And then we chose one case to present at each session. We invited child psychiatry trainees, child psychology trainees, our program directors, um, the inpatient child attending if they were uh, involved with the case. And then we inv invited leadership. We invited our ResNIC CMO, Dr. Chung, and our CNO, Patrick Loney, who will be joining me at the end of this session. And prior to each session, I would review the patient chart and I spoke with relevant individuals involved in the case to, uh, in case there was information about the adverse event that wasn't clearly documented in the chart. So, uh, so far this year, we've had two sessions, one in December, one in March. Each session was one hour long, um, just as a heads up for this is uh, how the sessions were attended. We had 12 attendees in the first session, 11 in the second session, uh, sorry, 12 trainees plus um, uh, faculty and, and uh, leadership. And in our first session, the adverse event we discussed was uh, a child patient who was restrained and IM'd after refusing to follow staff directions and go to their room due to uh, you know, foul language they were using. And the second session we talked about the adverse event was when a patient hit a nurse after making threats earlier in the day that they were actually gonna do it and then they did. How we structured the session, how I tried to structure the session, you know, uh, I, I can't, if people here in the uh, audience were there, you may know that uh, if you were keeping time, I'm not sure if it was exactly on these times, but I tried to keep it to five minutes framing the structure, emphasizing respect and confidentiality, 15 minutes presenting the case in a de-identified manner, 35 minutes performing the systems analysis of the event, and then five minutes reviewing the action items that were, will be taken away from the session afterwards. And then we use this fishbone analysis you saw earlier. I um, uh, modeled this, the factors here, similar to what was done in the Yale um, publication on their uh, Morbidity and Mortality Conference. And having this fishbone analysis was really vital to stimulating the group discussion. Uh, our group discussions were very rich um, and, and thorough with uh, what factors people felt contributed. And it really created a starting point for um, understanding what factors we did feel like did contribute. And then based on what we had in this fishbone, looking to see where do we want to place our focus now? What's gonna be our action item take what, What's the um, most important first step for um, change that we'd like to see made in the system? Okay. So after our two sessions, I reached out to the attendees and sent them surveys uh, to see uh, you know, what their perceptions were of these sessions. So the survey we sent out, we asked participants to rate their confidence in the three learning objectives we have for these sessions, and I'll talk about them. And we asked them to rate their confidence in these learning objectives before the session and after the session on a scale of four to excellent, a one to five scale. 
the uh, questions we asked, we asked to, for them to rate their uh, ability to recognize systemic influences on adverse events, their ability to communicate with their peers about adverse events without fear of blame or disrespect, and their sense of agency in improving systemic coordination of care. And I had eight total respondents uh, of the trainees and uh, we, I performed a t-test to analyze it. Okay. And before I move on to the um, actual results, I do wanna share that uh, we based our survey questions and how we formatted the questions based on the survey you might see at the end of this grand rounds actually that has been you know, validated before. Um, if you follow the survey prompts at the end, it'll ask you the same questions of your level of confidence in these um, areas before and after my grand round session. Okay, so here are the results. Uh, what I have here on the graph on the left, it shows you the survey respondents and their level of confidence in these three learning objectives before the session and their level of confidence after the sessions. Um, in red is their confidence in uh, recognizing systemic influences. In purple, it's their level of confidence in communicating with colleagues about adverse events and in blue, their sense of agency and improving systemic coordination of care. And so it's just, uh, before we even talk about the results, it's really striking to see the shift to the right um, in the after graph. And so here are the results that we have. So uh, the two learning objectives, the ability to communicate with colleagues without fear of blame or disrespect, and that sense of agency and improving systemic coordination of care, there uh, was a statistically significant improvement from uh, before to after. Uh, I think it is important to um, know that for the question about their ability to recognize systemic influences on adverse events, compared to the other two learning objectives, that learning objective actually had the highest mean um, even before the session started. Uh, people felt a little bit more confident in that um, arena. There was an improvement in the after, there was a trend um, in, the, in the improvement direction, but the p-value wasn't uh, statistically significant. But I think it's important to note that this had the highest um, baseline average as well. And uh, so the takeaway, I, I started mentioning this earlier on the last slide, but the biggest takeaway, I think the most exciting takeaway was that our sessions were successful in proving two of the three learning objectives. And while I'll go back to the last slide, while this um, first learning objective, there wasn't a significant, uh, statistically significant improvement, I think it's um, telling to uh, our trainees and their own or already sense of ability to actually um, recognize systemic factors um, that contribute to adverse events in psychiatry. Okay. So um, the other thing I asked in these surveys was for attendees to share with us what they intend to change in their practice based on what they learned in our sessions. And I thought this was uh, really meaningful. The, um, you know, actually I'll take a moment back because I think context is helpful for talking about those narratives. The, for people who were in the sessions, I wanted to just give a moment and highlight that the two um, discussions we had, and especially the first discussion we had, the first adverse event we uh, reviewed was a particularly challenging case where we talked about um, a child who was placed in restraints and and what's what led up to that and uh, and we talked about why we're ca categorizing that as an adverse event as opposed to um, kind of the plan uh, or what was appropriate at that time and uh, the 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 it, I think it the discussion that was had in that session and we'll talk a little bit more in my coming slides about what was. Um, so what made that session successful, but uh, there's something that I can't put to words in describing the um, the powerfulness and the meaning that came in that session. And so I I wanted to just put words to that and provide context to it. And I think 
by doing that, seeing the narratives that people shared after the session was really powerful and important um, to hear kind of the impact that these sessions had for them. So I wanted to share them with you here. The, uh, when we asked, what do you intend to change in your practice based on what you learned in the sessions? I shared some of these responses. Um, this first one said, I'll speak up more because I feel like it actually makes a difference and can have an impact seeing how leadership and interdisciplinary team members are changing behaviors and targeted goals. Similarly, someone else wrote, I think that now I have a better understanding of systemic influences on adverse events. I'll be more likely to bring systemic issues up to supervisors instead of feeling that it's not my place. Uh, there's also the comment that there's a greater sense that leadership will act to make structural change in response to trainees' concerns. I intend to report incidents where I'm concerned about patient safety. I plan to use the event reporting system more frequently. And lastly, more patient focus and less oppressive and punitive practices. And, you know, just reading these is uh, that, that there's some, uh, like it, it's so powerful reading that these were people's responses because uh, it's sometimes it's hard being a trainee and feeling helpless, uh, feeling like it's not your place, feeling like something we do actually makes a difference. And so um, I wanted to share these responses with you all as well. So then uh, takeaways, I wanted to talk about what I felt like made our conferences, our system improvement sessions successful beyond just the structure that we really tried to intentionally set up. And first I wanted to point out that um, I have co-fellows and co-psychology interns who are incredibly thoughtful and respectful. They are the ones that came to this session so ready to um, share their experiences, speak up in a, a comfortable setting, Oops, sorry, uh, speak up in an uncomfortable setting, um, share how, how they, how they feel these, um, these adverse events happened and what structural impacts it had. And so, uh, I think that that really was the, um, the most important factor, you know, without their presence and their ability to share those factors, these sessions wouldn't be successful and people wouldn't have uh, fed off of each other to make it successful. And equally importantly, I wanted to really highlight that the presence of leadership we had there was uh, so invaluable and so uh, appreciated that I can't even put words to it. I feel like it's one of those MasterCard commercials from, um, from our childhood where there was like talk about all these different things and their presence was priceless like that's what comes to mind uh and i think why was it so valuable you know we have leadership that are incredibly thoughtful as well they shared our concerns they acknowledged them they acknowledged suggestions they provided a lot of institutional knowledge that we don't have oftentimes as trainees what are the protocols what is in place what are the resources what resources do we not have available and then they were integral in helping create and actually enact action items um, and uh, so I wanted to highlight that and then lastly I wanted to look forward to um, now going from here so we've had these sessions and I'm actually uh, I'm actually thinking you know, what do we do in the future? What does UCLA fellowship do in the future? Some of the questions that came to my mind is who should be invited to these sessions moving forward? Um, how often, you know, or actually just going on those questions is, you know, should it be multidisciplinary? Should it be trainee only, training leadership, training leadership faculty, which faculty, which leadership? Um, lots of questions that come up in that, in that realm for me. The other question comes up is how often should these uh, sessions happen? Should they be quarterly, um, every two months, every month? Questions that come up is, you want to have it often enough where there can, there can actually be a sense of, um, there can actually be time for any actions that you've created to be implemented or started so that uh, if you're having it too frequently, there can be too many action items and nothing actually gets done. That can lead to um, less feeling of uh, helpfulness of these sessions. 
The other thing I was thinking about is how will cases be chosen in the future for these last two sessions? I was listening to cases and then going through them and thinking what might be the best learning uh, for us as trainees, but there wasn't a formal structure into choosing them. So that's something I think about. And lastly, I, I bring this question up, who should moderate? Because I am graduating and I hope that um, you all uh, take this talk and feel uh, motivated and, and interested to participate. And now that you all know what I know about these safety event reviews, any and all of you will hopefully be able to moderate them in the future. And so uh, with that, I will say thank you. I will um, share my references. And I want to just thank you for your time and, and joining and participating. And um, thank you for any questions, any and all questions you have. So I'll stop my share here. That was beautiful. Thank you so much, Mata, for that. And you haven't graduated yet, so um, we may keep you. So you could just keep <laughs> to run these, which I'm sure you love. That's, that, that's, I'll, stay, I'll stay for these. <laughs> I'll stay for these. You know, I will say, uh, uh, just in, in, I say that jokingly, but in all seriousness, these conferences, and especially that first one, as I was reflecting back on it, one of the most powerful memories, I think, of fellowship uh, was being in that room that day and having that conversation, having that session. And so something that will definitely stick with me beyond, um, beyond web training. That was, um, you know, you, you talked about a MasterCard commercial and it made yeah. me smile because it's, it's kind of true. I, I think yeah. certainly these, these sessions, CMHSIS, Child Mental yeah. Health System Improvement Series, um, if you were in the room and you witnessed what occurred, it was really powerful the sharing, the exchange of ideas, um, really hearing from people's kind of lived experience. And it was just very, um, it was a beautiful thing to witness. And so that's my first question maybe for both of you, Mata and, and Patrick, just kind of thinking about um, how this process uh, of, of creating this went. So as you created this series, um, did you find it difficult to balance process versus action? So this is what I mean. So process meaning kind of honoring the experience of all those present mm -hmm. staff, faculty, trainees versus action, meaning coming up with those takeaway action items for hospitals, um, for our you know, protocols and for policies. Yeah, that's a, a really good question and um, something we've I was thinking about before these sessions happened too. I know we've had we had conversations around this of being intentional also with who we invite so that we can allow the process to happen. Uh, but also if it's only process and no action, then sometimes there might be that feeling of helplessness of okay, we're talking about these issues. And there is a role to processing. There is there is helpfulness to processing. Um, but we also have other avenues for processing process groups too. Uh, you know, our own like groups or our own kind of fellow um, uh, groups. And so I think there has to be that fine balance between the two of having room to process and having some space to say, now what? And I think that's what led to those really nice narratives that people shared and that shift in those perceptions before and after the conference, that was powerful because it felt like there was a now what. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and um, thank you. And from my perspective, I was really just thankful and honored to be part of the process. Um, that first one where we discussed the restraint case was really moving for me personally as well. And I sort of had an aha moment where we actually have a lot of alignment. We're all in this together. Um, you know, we all um, participate in the treatment of the patient and whether restraints happen, you know, what are our process? What's our culture? Um, how, do, how do we avoid harm to patients? Uh, how do we avoid harm to staff? And so for me, um, it was sort of an aha moment. Of how, do we, how do we align some of these discussions in terms of the process that actually informs a lot of action that we already wanted to take. So it was really, um, really helpful to hear um, and be a part of it because we have a lot of goals around 
restraint reduction. We want to go, and I see Colleen Davidson's on here too. We um, we have goals to go to zero, um, which is is amazing. It'll be challenging, but we need everybody. So for me, it's um, it also informs future actions, and then we have more helpers and more minds to work on this as we go forward. I think, yeah, I, I, I think that, you know, we, we were talking about this, Patrick and I, before around, um, like, how, who to invite to and how, how to create the space for this multidisciplinary action, too. There's such a value um, with your presence there, coming from the nursing perspective, where there's so much that, as trainees, we don't see the behind, we don't see what's behind the curtain or how things are run. And um, there was so much information just in terms of what already is in place. I think that second point had a slide where it talked about goals of um, m, m conferences and it said to, you know, to reduce atrogenic harm. But before that, it was um, like utilizing the systems that are already in place. And I see your background um, filter right now, this commitment to zero harm. I've never seen that filter before. Thank you for putting that up. I have a feeling you put it up for, for our session today. And th that these are already goals that UCLA has. How can we as trainees, like you said, like be part of that? So there is this higher kind of um, commitment that like what we're doing actually is meaningful and making change. Maybe I can ask a question uh, to both of you, uh, you know, to riff off of your question, Matt, at the very end, you just in, in terms of this is the creation, this is the inaugural year of this mental health um, improvement series. So thinking about your vision, both of your vision for what this could be going forward, future iterations of this, if you had to dream out loud, um, what are the pieces that you'd like to take from mm -hmm. the two, you know, sessions we've had so far, and how would you like to uh, develop them? In what direction? Meaning who would be at the table? Um, you know, what would be the goals? Just kind of thinking out loud. That's a really good question. Uh, I think I would, I would suggest structurally having it quarterly. Uh, I think that gives it enough time for it to be meaningful who at the table, um, it would be our trainees like we've had. If I could have Patrick and Dr. Chung there every single time I would, I don't know how, how, how many more times I'll answer my call last minute. Can you please join us? Do you have time? And then they're so gracious with their time. Uh, but I, do, I, I don't know if that's possible, but ideally having, having your presence um, at, at, at these sessions, I think would be important. And I think in terms of you know, faculty involvement, if it is a case that involves um, a patient on the inpatient unit, having faculty members from the inpatient unit or the medical director that's being selected, I think would be really important to someone who has a stake in the game and, and has some, some uh, kind of oversight to how to implement these changes going forward as well. Um, yeah, Patrick, I'm curious your thoughts on that too. Yeah, um, I completely agree. I think, some ability to have uh, a, a few of us there while honoring the educational process for the fellows in the, pro in the process of, of learning about how to look at this in a just culture sort of way. But maybe um, this is a really powerful thing in terms of what the recommendations of the group would be. And then we could tie that into existing structures for our improvement efforts around restraints and staff well-being and improvement of care that maybe we could uh, make this uh, a, a nice line to our, our our existing efforts because there is a lot of alignment. So um, yeah. I'm kind of thinking that could be a cool next step too. I think you bring up a good point there because what that alignment is what made that first session so successful. That just by chance where we started talking about restraints and you guys were already you're already looking at restraints too and how to reduce it. And so it brings in my mind when we choose cases, trying to be mindful of is there a case that's already on the radar of the hospital where there is like this desire to make change. And then, so how can we bring that to uh, like there's parallel processes? How can we bring that to the trainees, do our own systems analysis in this conference, and then bring that together with what's being happened in the hospital system. And that's a little bit of what happened after our first session. You know, we had our, our conference 
And then afterwards, there was an incident review committee that reviewed the case as well in this more multidisciplinary fashion where nurses was invited, security was invited, um, uh, the uh, other uh, members of the incident review team were invited. So there, that there was action that can be taken par in a parallel way. So that could be something to think about when we choose cases, how to, who do you touch base with to see, you know, what is the hospital looking to improve and how can we do that on the, on the training side as well? Yeah, I think that's brilliant because I think there's been some really challenging cases that we want to learn from and, and make improvements. You know, the, the assault on healthcare workers piece is vexing. You know, we're trying to provide the best possible care, but, you know, nationally and certainly here in Resnick, it's a, it's a challenge. Um, I think equitable care and how we how we do that, you know, particularly with regard to restraint, seclusion and emergency IMs. Um, our, our, our issues to continue to align around. And also just sort of, um, you know, we've had some issues that are, you know, we in the past just kind of really challenging to deal with. We had uh, on 4 West uh, a patient who was hurling racial epithets at staff, which had a very powerful effect. But how do we do that well in, with, in the care of the patient, but also, you know, what's the right thing to do with staff? I think there's a, a variety of fronts that we could work on some of these things together. Mm -hmm. I'm so glad you bring that up because that that brings up that process part too. When staff witness that, when fellows, when trainees witness that, um, it has an effect on all of our morales. And if we don't talk about it in sessions like this, it, it can feel like there's this culture of silence that no one's paying attention. But actually, that process part you're bringing up, Misty, is part of the um, part of it too, along with the action then of what we do about it. Well, thank you so much. It's such a, a, again, very rich discussion. We will keep this alive. Don't you worry. I promise. Um, and we will figure out kind of what this will look like going forward. I think, you know, quarterly sounds lovely and certainly Patrick aligning with you and the initiatives that are already in place is just so smart. Uh, this, this can be a bridge to get there in terms of kind of some of our recommendations coming from the child division. Um, Thank you both. Just lovely presentation, Mata and Patrick. Thank you for joining us today. Absolutely. See y'all later. All right. Thank you all.